First John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Forgive us our sins, O Lord, the sins of our past and our, our present and past, the sins of our souls, our words, and our bodies, the sins we have done to please ourselves, and the sins we have done to please others. Forgive us our casual sins and our deliberate sins and those we have labored so to hide that we have hidden them even from ourselves. Forgive us, O Lord. Forgive all our sin. Only by your grace, for Jesus' sake, amen. And the assurance of pardon comes from 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our, all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's God's word. As we uh, come to God's word today, we continue in the Gospel of John. And we're uh, halfway through the 14th chapter, so we'll be picking up with verse 15. And we, we ask the Lord to bless the reading and the hearing and the proclamation of the word uh, that we take it in and, um, and, and ring it out for all it's worth in our lives because it's worth a lot. The word of God. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Some of you are familiar with Johnny Erickson Tata and her ministry, uh, Johnny and Friends. Johnny was uh, disabled, became a quadriplegic in a diving accident uh, when she was a young uh, lady. And uh, her ministry, uh, particularly Johnny and Friends, is a ministry uh, for people and to people and with people who have disabilities. And uh, Bon Clark in our own assembly grounds up in North Carolina has hosted Johnny and Friends uh, uh, weeks as they have come and, and the wonderful ministry that takes place there. And so after one family retreat uh, for the week, 
They were passing the mic around for anyone that wanted to say something about what they had learned or how they'd been encouraged or what fun they had had or and, and those kinds of things just to share. And, and Jeff took the mic and, and uh, he kind of won everyone's hearts during the week. Jeff has Down syndrome and they had just, just connected. And so they were excited that he was going to say something and he did. He said, Let's go home. That was his message. That's all he said. Well, afterwards, Johnny was talking, or his mom was talking with Johnny and said, you know, uh, this, uh, this week his daddy was working and couldn't come with us, and he's really missed his daddy. He's had a great time. You've seen. He's had a wonderful week, but he misses his daddy, and he just wants to see his daddy. He wants to be home. And Johnny said, you know, I get that. I get that. I miss my Abba Father. I long to be in his presence where I will be made whole. I long for that. And she says, don't miss the chance down here on earth to begin investing in eternity so that heaven can be your heart's home. Her heart was already home there. John 14 is taking place in the upper room as Jesus gathers his disciples for this last Passover feast together. And Jesus will take the bread and he'll take the cup of wine and he will show them what the Passover was ultimately about, that it was always pointing toward this, that God's deliverance of his people would be through Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John 14 begins, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. It's as if Jesus is saying, I'm dying for you to meet my Father. And literally, he is dying so that we can meet the Father. That's why he came. C.S. Lewis remarking on how God does indeed provide joys and delights and happiness throughout our journey on earth, but always in a mixed bag of hardships and troubles as well for ourselves and for other people. It says this, our Father refreshes us on the journey with some pleasant ends, but will not encourage us to mistake them for home. Whenever there is an attempt to create a utopian society, a perfect society, heaven on earth. Well, you've seen all the movies and you've read the books, whether it's Brave New World or The Hunger Games, it always turns into a dystopian society because the problem isn't with the plan, the problem is with the people, beginning with those that make the plan. It, enable, it inevitably unravels because this is not ultimately our home. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. This has been the psalm that's floated through my mind all week as I've thought about this particular passage. Psalm 103 is a psalm. It's meant to be sung. It is still sung. And it's one of those psalms that has found its way into some of the contemporary music as well. The version that was going through my mind in song was Laura Story's version of Bless the Lord, O My Soul. But we sing Matt Redmond's 10,000 Reasons. We have many reasons, and that's what that psalm says, to bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Jesus describes in this chapter truth for troubled hearts. And then moving into the second half where we are now, he encourages his followers that we are covered. He's got us covered. He is our hope. And Jesus is dealing in verses 15 through 24, he's dealing with our loneliness here. He knows that we need his presence, but there will be times when we need his presence in a special way. His disciples have enjoyed his presence with them for three years, covering them. 
helping them. And Jesus says that one of his promises to them is that when he returns to the Father, and by the way, he says, you would, should be, I, 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 would you have been rejoicing with this news that I'm going to the Father? Because it's not a consolation prize. It's the prize. And he longs to be reunited with his father just as Jeff wanted to be with his daddy and just as Johnny says, I have a heart for home. Jesus says, I have a heart for home. And he will send another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, verse 16. Now, Jesus had told them earlier in this chapter, remember, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And now he says, I will send you another helper, the spirit of truth. Because Jesus had them covered. From then on and even to now, believers are covered by the indwelling Holy Spirit. That is Jesus' promise and that is Jesus' comfort to his followers to this day. The word he uses, helper, parakletos, is translated in English in different ways because it's hard to capture the fullness of what the Holy Spirit does in one word as He comes alongside and more than that indwells us. Paracletus, our helper, our comforter, our counselor, our advocate. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity who becomes a human being and lives in perfect obedience to God throughout His earthly life was the helper and the comforter and the counselor and the advocate for his disciples all through those years. And he still is. He still is in heaven doing that for us. But as he prepares them and us for the separation that is going to come until he comes again, and again, he affirms that in this passage in in verse 3, he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again so that we live between that time. And he wants us to be aware of that, that we're living between these times. But we're encouraged because we will not be alone. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and indeed, he is a person, as it says here, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. It's not just a force or a power or an idea. It is the third person of the Trinity who comes alongside and is with us. He will be given to us. He will indwell us and never leave us. So we are covered Jesus knows that at times we will feel like orphans. He says, I will not leave you as orphans in verse 18. But we can feel like orphans, like we're living in the wrong world. Because we're living in a world that is wrong. And our hearts, the more they beat in tune with God's word and God's design, we know that it's out of tune with God. We know that. We can feel as orphans. And so he promised to come and live with us. He offers us the greatest possible company for those who love him. The Father and the Son dwells, he says, with us. What is, a, what is your dwelling? It's your house, right? It's your home. That's your dwelling place. And Jesus says that he and the Father will dwell with us, will come to make home with us and in us. You can't get better company than that. In Jesus' incarnation, he walked this earth as one of us. He slept here, he played here, he worked here, and he loved here. He could be seen and heard and touched and spoken with. He was truth incarnate, truth in a body, and he lives that out. But now he says in this promise that he will send another helper, a second advocate. He says you're not going to be able to see this helper and this comforter in the same way that they could see Jesus 
And yet we will, he says, see this spirit of truth because the helper will live within us, will dwell with us and in us. He says, the Father who loves us will send the helper, and he'll send the helper out of his love for us because he's got us covered. We know what an authentic, what authentic advocates are. We know what they do. They're real. They're not imaginary. And Jesus promises to defend us in a real way. He promises to stand in the way of those who intend harm to us. He promises to speak well of us into a world that frankly has very tiny ears to hear spiritual things. They don't hear it. They don't receive it. He promises to encourage us. He promises to be here with us to comfort us. And part of the work of the Holy Spirit is when we get lazy, He's going to prod us. He's going to nudge us along. He's going to move us to where we need to be going. That's the work of the Holy Spirit within us. That is the promise that we have. Jesus is promising His presence and the Helper's presence and the Father's presence. He says it in a couple different ways. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And then in verse 23, he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all brought into our life through the gift of this counselor, this comforter, this helper, the Holy Spirit. Jesus promises not only to be within us, but to surround us. Because of the Holy Spirit, we have a promise of Jesus being with us. His promise is not that we will not have troubles. Jesus has already been described in, in chapter 13, verse 21, as being troubled in his spirit. And this chapter begins, let not your hearts be troubled. And the present tense of that doesn't suggest that our hearts aren't troubled, just don't let it get in there. It's talking about their hearts are already troubled. And you could say, well, just... Stop being troubled. Well, if that worked, that would be great. But even Jesus doesn't just say stop being troubled. That is what he intends here. But he gives a solid reason. He tells us why we don't have to despair even when we feel lonely, when we feel overwhelmed, even when we are troubled. Because he has us covered. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. And as the psalm goes on, it talks about his steadfast love that is everlasting. As our helper and our advocate, Jesus promises to advise us, to let us know God's way. And he's promising to really do this, not just figuratively, not just in our imaginations, he tells us that we will be able to see what the world cannot see. Verse 17, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, namely his company, his presence with us. The world doesn't understand that. It can't conceive of that. It often thinks we're just whistling in the dark to make ourselves feel better. But in fact, God through His Spirit, indwelling us, changes us from the inside out. So Jesus says, yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. 
We sing a song about that. Some of you may remember it. We sang it in the other services this morning. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. He holds the future. We can face uncertain days because he lives. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Notice this also. Jesus is speaking to them as a group. The you here is a plural you. Greek is helpful in that in the same way the south is helpful in that. There is you and there is y'all. And it's very clear, you know, which is being said. And this is a y'all in the Greek. He's talking to all of them. He told them about the helper, about the paracletus. Together, Jesus places them and us into this company of believers into a squadron of the faithful, into the communion of the saints. He puts us together that way, and the Holy Spirit is in us and with us. Jesus here wasn't talking about just individual audiences, that it's just Jesus and me. Jesus and you, and they're, we're, we're going to go it alone. We're going to face the world alone. Jesus, thankfully, doesn't call us to that. Instead, he promised to be with y'all. In the plural, the helper and the advocate would be there. Now, he does encourage us to regularly invest time alone with the Lord, that we read his word and he speaks to us through his word and we pray. Because one of the things about praying alone is that we're not distracted about what others may think of our prayers. Did I use the right word? Was I spiritual enough in my prayers? Jesus doesn't want us to put on a front in our prayers. And so when we're with the Lord, we can, we can just pray. That's what he wants us to do. We can express our concerns or our worries or our fears or our laments as well as our praises and do it without distraction. But when there is an urgent need, the Lord very often, maybe even most often, comes to us through other human beings like ourselves with their own wounds and limps and hesitancies and shortcomings. So that means that Jesus is sending us out of our time alone with Him, out of our prayer closets, if you will, and away from the quiet ponderings and away from daydreams so that real helpers in physical form can aid us. The work of the Holy Spirit through the body of Christ, through the communion of saints, takes place that way. Jesus sends us as an example that we can see a, a, an advocate to counsel us, a champion when our strength is gone and we are weak, a person with gifts that we need but do not have at that moment. And other times, Jesus will send us out to be those real, tangible helpers in His name, the work of the Holy Spirit in and through us. We declare in the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the communion of the saints, and we do. Jesus says that His way for life is marvelously dependent upon the communion of the saints. And what we would privatize, Jesus makes public. What we might selfishly personalize, Jesus puts on display amongst the faithful. And what we might be inclined to hold on to very, very tightly, like a young child may clutch his or her teddy bear, the Holy Spirit may take that out of our hands because He has more for us and we can't hold it if we're clutching so tightly. And so the Holy Spirit is at work and He's at work through the communion of the saints. He's at work through the body of Christ. And that's the advocate and helper's work to this day. And then Jesus promises in verses 25 to 31 his peace. 
through the Holy Spirit. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. The peace that comes from God is a given peace. It cannot be attained in any other way. That's one of the distinctive characters of God's peace. It's given. It cannot be earned. It cannot be seized. We can't go after His peace and grab it for ourselves. God actually wants to give us His peace. The fearful or the troubled heart is a heart that's in need of a gift. It's not in need of a task. It's not in need of a duty. It's not in need of something to do in order to earn and merit. The troubled heart needs a gift. The human heart and a troubled heart needs to be opened because a troubled heart tends to close off and shut down. A troubled heart doesn't need to be burdened with guilt or more duties. We receive grace in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Peace, as given by Jesus, is His accomplishment in us. It's not our attainment in Him. You see the difference? It's a gift that we would receive. The disciples, through their time with Jesus, have grown in their faith. But they have more growing to do. Through Jesus' death and resurrection and His ascension into heaven and then the sending of the Holy Spirit, the other helper, they're going to grow even more. And as they grow, they will not grow in independence. That's not growth. That's part of the human problem, that everyone wants to be independent and do their own thing and go their own way and be affirmed in so doing. Jesus says that growth involves a greater dependence upon Him. And then we're not locked into needing the affirmation and the approval of others because we have the smile and the favor and the delight and even the applause of our Father in heaven. That's the joy that we have. The disciples have been learning and at times forgetting through their time with Jesus, that God is sovereign. God can do anything He wants to do. They have been learning that God is love. And God wants to do good for His people. He wants to do something for us. And they have been learning that God is a covenant-keeping God that he's bound by his own word, and he will do something. He does act on our behalf. Jesus wants their faith, and he wants our faith to feed off the character of Christ himself. He will send another helper. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. We are covered. As we come to the Lord's table, we remember that Holy Communion is a sacrament. That it's not just us gathered here, eating a crumb of bread and a thimble full of grape juice. That Jesus Christ Himself is the host of this table. And He welcomes His people here. And through the Holy Spirit, He meets with us and dines with us and us with one another. And we feed upon Him by faith. And it's one enactment of the communion of the saints. Jesus said, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Holy communion is a tangible remembrance of Jesus, of His teachings, but more than that, a tangible representation of his life and death and resurrection and of his coming again. As we come to the Lord's table, 
the invitation to this table because it is his table is that if you are his if by faith you have received Christ as your Savior and Lord the gift of the Holy Spirit has opened your eyes and heart to the truth of the gospel and you have put your trust in him and then this table is for you If you're walking with a limp, if you've got hesitancies, if you're halting, if you're painfully aware that you don't measure up in every way, but you're resting in Christ, this table's for you. He doesn't say get strong enough and then you can come. He says, come, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you my rest. I will give you my peace. He gives us himself. So this table is for any who put their trust in Christ, and you are welcome to participate in the bread and cup as it's distributed. If you've not yet come to that place of faith in Christ, then there is a warning that comes in 1 Corinthians that says rather than being blessing it can actually be cursing to you and so the encouragement there would be to let it pass but to pray Lord I'm not sure what I'm missing apparently I'm missing you and I want you that's the beginning may not sound like a profound prayer but if it's from your heart the Lord hears that prayer And he will work in your heart. So there is the invitation. The Apostle Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that in the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this whenever you eat it and remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remember me. For when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Father, we pray that you would set apart this bread and this cup, ordinary elements of life to this holy purpose the sacrament that we would feed upon you by faith that we would enjoy together your Holy Spirit and the communion of the saints in Christ Jesus our Lord Amen the bread and the cup are given as the elders distribute that you may commune of both when you receive and when you're ready uh, to do so Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen, the word of the Lord, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.